Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the James Julia Auction House taking a look at some of the guns they're going to be selling in their upcoming Fall of 2017 firearms auction. And today, we're taking a look at a couple of Confederate handguns. These are Griswold and Gunnison revolvers. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, Confederate pistols. I can predict what this story is going to be like. Some guy said, I'll make pistols for a lot of money, and then failed to really make anything effective, and then went out of business, and the end. Well, that's the kind of typical overview of a Confederate arms maker. However, Griswold and Gunnison is a definite exception to that rule. Now, the two people involved in this story are Arvin, uh, Arvin Gunnison and Samuel Griswold. We'll start with Samuel Griswold. He uh, was actually born in Connecticut and he moved down to the South in 1822 and uh, became a very successful entrepreneur. Um, and actually, you could almost say industrialist as far as there was such a thing uh, in Georgia at the time. In 1835, he bought 4,000 acres of property uh, a couple miles south of Macon, and he set up what became uh, Griswoldville, actually is what it was called. And he had a wide array of different business endeavors going. Uh, this place was big enough, it had a post office, uh, and then he had a grist mill, he had a sawmill, he had a foundry, uh, he had a candle factory, he had a very nice elaborate mansion that he lived in. I presume he probably had some agricultural fields, although I don't know for sure. And maybe most importantly, he had a factory for making cotton gins, which is to say uh, machines that are used to separate seed from cotton fiber, um, a very important thing in the South. And this guy clearly was doing well, had a lot of money, uh, and when the war broke out, he wanted to do something to aid the war effort. So in 1862, uh, in the spring, the first thing he did was start manufacturing pikes, as in, yeah, the uh, pointy medieval weapon on a wooden stick. Uh, the Confederate government was looking for some, presumably for, I don't know what, some sort of guards for something. Uh, and he made a couple hundred and delivered them and it all worked fine. But of course, making a pike is pretty easy. In the summer of 1862, he, he proposed to also make revolvers for the Confederate government. And in this endeavor, he was aided by Arvin Gunnison, who had actually been in the business of making revolvers, at least on a very small scale, in New Orleans. And uh, he fled New Orleans at the beginning of the war, made his way down to Georgia and hooked up with uh, Griswold. Gunnison had brought some of his tooling with him, and between Gunnison's tooling and Griswold's actual factory setup, um, he, he turned his cotton gin factory into an arms factory. This was really an ideal situation for actually making guns. And Griswold and Gunnison would turn out to be by far the most reliable and one of the highest quality uh, Confederate revolvers made during the war. They made something like 3,700 total which is pretty much the, that, that's as many as every other Confederate arms, or Confederate revolver maker made all put together. Uh, and their, their production was consistent and high quality and reliable. And this is exactly what the Confederacy needed in terms of arms manufacturers. And it's kind of what the Union had as its standard. Everybody in the Union was capable of doing that. But this sort of industry was much harder to find in the South. So we have three examples of the Griswold and Gunnison here to take a look at today. Uh, and there, there are just a couple of variations. Now the biggest variation is this one, which actually has an iron frame, and that is extremely unusual. In fact, this is the only known documented iron frame Griswold. Now people excavating the site of Griswoldville have found iron frames there, but nobody has found another actual complete iron framed gun. And the exact provenance of when that was done, how it was done, really isn't, uh, isn't clear. However, beyond that, these revolvers really just had to be a breath of fresh air for Confederate ordnance because they were all standardized. Yes, they were hand-fitted guns. These aren't, you know, interchangeable part sorts of examples of modern, modern technology and manufacturing processes, but Griswold and Gunnison started making guns, they made guns consistently, and they made uniform guns, and that is it's exactly what the Confederates needed, as opposed to their normal mishmash of hopeful and naive uh, inventors and would-be industrialists who couldn't manage to put together three parts to save their own lives. So as a general overview, what we have here is basically a copy of the Colt 3rd Pattern Dragoon 
Uh, this is Navy caliber, so 36 caliber, six shot brass frame. A um, couple characteristic details. Uh, one of the most visible is that the grips on these are all kind of tilted backwards. It kind of looks like you know someone started using the bottom of the grip as a hammer and bent it, but that's not the case. That's all of the Griswold and Gunnisons exhibit that shape. That's just how they were made. There is no capping groove in the frame. Normally on a, a Colt, for example, you'd have a little center groove here that would give you something that you could kind of center a percussion cap in while you were loading and capping the cylinder. And these don't have that. Serial numbers on these are located in a couple places, on the frame, on the cylinder, on the shank of the barrel. You will sometimes have a serial number on the trigger guard, but not always. The one variation that you will find uh, in Griswold revolvers is the barrel shank here. Um, at approximately serial number 1500, they went from being round to being octagonal. There are a few exceptions to that rule, but in general, uh, that's, that changed, and that's really the only change. Beyond that, all of the Griswold and Gunnisons are as, as identical as you can have hand-fitted guns be. One interesting characteristic of these is, of course, getting materials was always was a perennial problem in the South for the Confederacy. Uh, steel in particular. There were not very many sources of it. It was always in limited quantity. And so Griswold and Gunnison chose to make their parts entirely out of iron. And I think this kind of scared the hell out of the Confederate arsenal inspectors. Uh, but they went ahead and proofed the guns and they passed proof testing. And so, you know, I can just see the inspector going, geez, iron, uh, okay, uh, we'll try it. Uh, for the cylinders, they actually used a twisted uh, bar iron stock. And on a lot of the guns, you can actually see striations here that show that twist. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see in this one, but I do happen to have access to this revolver, which is not in this current uh, Julius sale. And it really clearly shows you uh, the twist of the iron. So some of the, some of the Griswolds you can see it, some you can't, uh, but that's the material that they used in making these cylinders. And it actually worked. Just seeing a serial number in the 2000 range is remarkable for any Confederate manufactured revolver. Uh, there was nobody else in the South who was making guns uh, at this level of quality and consistency. This particular Griswold is also pretty cool here for being engraved to uh, a Major Brown of the 7th Virginia Regiment CSA. Well, that's kind of cool. You Usually, again, there aren't enough of these uh, Confederate revolvers for them to have been made into uh, presentation guns. This one almost certainly, th this is not a gun that was used like as a way to try and bribe ordinance for adoption of the gun, as was relatively common on both sides of, uh, of the border in the Civil War. This one's a uh, relatively mid to late production, you know, 2200. So this is one that somebody bought and had engraved. Griswold and Gunnison were able to plug along, making right about 100 revolvers a month, consistently and predictably, uh, up until November 22nd of 1864, when Griswoldville was attacked by the Union Army, uh, Kentucky and Ohio elements of the Union Army, and it was pretty much completely destroyed. Uh, Griswold's mansion actually survived, I think because it was turned into a Union uh, Army headquarters, but pretty much everything else on the the site, the factory complex, uh, was torched, burned to the ground. And that was it for uh, Griswold and Gunnison. They didn't set up, they, did, they weren't able to move, they weren't able to reset uh, new production anywhere else. That was, that was the end of it. So uh, obviously, as with all Confederate revolvers, there aren't a whole lot of surviving examples, but we have more Griswold and Gunnisons than a lot of other types. Uh, if you are interested in having one yourself, whether it is a standard one or an iron frame one or a presentation engraved one, well, all of these are coming up for sale here at James Julia. If you take a look at the description text below, you'll find links to the catalog pages for all three of these. And uh, you can take a look at uh, Julia's pictures and provenance and descriptions, all that sort of stuff. Place bids on them if you're interested. Thanks for watching.